I'll be reading from both John and 1 John. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. And 1 John 5, 1, 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that the love that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the, only with the water, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The word of God for the people of God. What should we do with our lives? This is a question I ask all the time with people in my lines of work. Already many have asked my children, the oldest not yet in kindergarten, a form of that question, curiously pondering, what do you want to be when you grow up? My dad, who's approaching retirement, has wistfully and playfully told me several times in the past decade, lifting his eyebrows as high as they will go, I'm not sure what I want to be when I grow up. We may answer this question of how we should spend our lives with some indication of how we spend or have spent our lives as people who have worked within or outside the home those things that we have dedicated our lives to, our time to, have offered a form of our identity to. As an educator or a lawyer, a dog trainer or an architect, a hospital administrator, an accountant, a stay-at-home parent, an executive or an entrepreneur. We might answer this same question, though, another way with nothing related to how we buy groceries or what uniform we wore during the work week. American writer and humorist Kurt Vonnegut mused that in life we should do many things, obviously, but the most daring is to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. That's how we should spend our lives. Loneliness, a disease so sinister and pervasive, such a pressing concern of our age, 
I've mentioned it previously, the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has called it a pandemic of its own accord. But it's a problem not just in the U.S., but of global proportions. A 2023 Gallup poll suggested that one in four adults across the world have reported very or very or fairly high levels of loneliness. And this loneliness, of course, is linked to significant physical and mental health effects. We live in a world full of rapidly expanding technology that both enhances and prevents meaningful connections. And in such a world, the church ought to be a joyful light to a world of lonely people, knowing that one of the greatest gifts we have been given from God is brothers and sisters, siblings in faith to share life's journey. Not just a group of people who like the same style of church music or who can put up with the same pastor for long enough, but a beloved community Or as late author Rachel Held Evans described the church, a bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry, because they said yes, and there's always room for more. But sometimes we're not so great at loving one another We sometimes go to the church, keep our heads down, ignore the searching eyes like those in the cafeteria, feeling more comfortable with our current dining partners than the newbie who should just find their own way, maybe their own table. For evidence of this, you can see much of church history or just on the map pick any random congregation across the world, and at some point in their history, you'll have seen that they imperfectly lived up to our call or failed to live up to our call. You'll find missed opportunities on all of our parts at some point or another for love and friendship in favor of comfort with those who share the same zip code or dress code as us. And of course, most churches will say they are are welcoming of of all, but that welcome often means those who are willing to decode the existing culture of how we do things around here if you want to be one of us. Our world is yearning for authentic and meaningful connection. And the church is a place where they should be able to, and I think often can, find that. Journalist Billy Baker, in his book on friendship, wrote, knowing that you can rely on someone and that they can rely on you is one of the most fulfilling of human interactions. There is profound mutual benefit there, yes, but also profound joy. The spark of human connection is second only to the spark of love. I like you and you like me, and together we won't have to climb these mountains alone. That's how he describes friendship. That's how we might describe the church. Now, Baker makes a journalistic and sociological argument in favor of cultivating meaningful relationships, meaningful friendships for the sake of well-being. And that's an important argument to make. We need not dispute it. But our scripture for today extends beyond such concerns. For the significance of friendship that we have beyond the immediate and tangible benefits is underscored with the spiritual and transcendent nature of our friendship with one another, but also with Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, which you heard read this morning, We heard Jesus' imperative to love. And if you've been hanging out with us the past few weeks, 
It's starting to sound a little familiar, right? So First uh, John, the author of First John, the Gospel of John, hits some of these same notes again and again and again. Jesus' imperative to love is a theme that we've been focused on for the past few weeks as we encounter a series on discipleship entitled Light and Love and Walking the Walk. This is my commandment, Jesus says again, that you love one another as I have loved you. But in this passage for today, Jesus makes it even clearer with a very memorable description that many of you might know, that no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We know from Jesus' example that the kind of love and friendship that we're called to is not marked by competition or scarcity or superficiality the typical markers that we encounter in our culture today. Instead, Jesus' model of love and friendship is is sacrificial, it's abundant, and it goes right to the core of our very existence. And so in that excerpt from 1 John, we are afforded a way of getting a pulse check on our faith. And I want to share with you another translation of that passage from the message that says something like this of how we can check on how we're doing with our our faith lived out. The reality test is this, on whether or not we love God's children. Do we love God? Do we keep God's commandments? The proof that we love God comes from when we keep those commandments and that they are not troublesome or burdensome. Though some commandments that we encounter, divine and otherwise, may feel burdensome, the commandments of loving God and others are not meant to be such. They lead us to truth and beauty and wholeness, not without cost, but with significant impact. You must love and befriend so that you know joy. What a gift if we could obey this commandment day in and day out. Jesus taught about friendship in the way that he spoke, but also in what he did. In scripture, friendship and love requires action. It's something we do. It's something that changes us, that transforms us. We know that our Lord embraced people from all walks of life, especially those often left out, those lonely, those pushed aside, He showed compassion to them and vulnerability. He wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Jesus loved his friends and identified with their pain. He served them. He watched the defeat of the disciples, modeling servanthood in love, even washing the feet of Judas, the one whom he knew would betray him. Jesus encouraged his friends and participated in radical truth-telling. I had a friend in high school who always said, a, a good friend is someone who tells you you have spinach in your teeth. But this is much more of an important truth. For Jesus himself was the truth. Who we are at our Holy Spirit empowered best is made clear in how we live out our faith. And scripture makes clear that we are called to love through both service and friendship. We read in our scripture this morning, however, that Jesus says you are no longer just servants, but you are friends. Serving Christ would be a meaningful enough answer to that question, what should we do with our lives? But Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life gives us an additional answer. He lets us in on the truth like good friends are prone to do. And so through such knowledge, the Lord of Lords calls us friend. And in doing so, empowers and emboldens and emancipates us. Jesus is quick to remind us, though, that the gift of friendship is not our own doing. You did not choose me, but I chose you. 
In my life, I have fell into friendship through circumstance and convenience many times, but I also know what a blessing it can be by grace, undeservedly to befriend someone when I was feeling wobbly or insecure or altogether lost. Let's be friends, offered a fellow first grader on the playground when I didn't know anybody. I've decided that we're going to be friends, laughingly declared the only other seventh grader who was late to lunch on the first day of middle school. Did we just become best friends, said two lifelong friends who I share friendship with to this day at a college orientation for first-year students. There are people who have taught me that to make friends, you have to be a friend. And in the midst of our loneliness and despair, can we ever find a friend so faithful as our friend Jesus? We sang this morning, this is the Jesus who chose us, who chose to share our sorrows, chose to bless us in our weaknesses, and chose to invite us to take everything to him in prayer. What an undeserved gift. True grace. The friend who chose us before we could even invite him to dinner. We do not earn this friendship, but rather it's a gift given to us for a purpose. And that purpose, Jesus said, is to bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Theologian John Calvin described all the blessings that we enjoy are divine deposits committed to our trust on this condition that they should be dispensed for the benefit of our neighbors. Every good gift that we have comes from God, Scripture tells us, and those are gifts meant to be shared. We have been gifted friendship and love so that we can befriend and love one another. The fruit of the Spirit evinced in the love and friendship we share in our lives. To bear the fruit Christ calls us to bear in friendship and love can come at a cost, a willingness to let go of our pride or our ego, our defensiveness, and sometimes are willing to be offensive. In our second scripture reading for today, a community that was shaped by John's gospel was encountering divisions and debate. Perhaps like us, when feeling defensive, they put on their own masks of power and authority rather than vulnerably setting them aside with friendship and love. Such laying down of these masks, our opportunity to do so, reminded me of a letter from the work, from the work, a letter from a region in my mind, written by activist and author James Baldwin. He was talking about how we love and become faithful in such a troubled world, and he wrote this. It is for this reason that love is so desperately sought and so cunningly avoided. Love takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. Baldwin's words might serve as a reminder for us in the church at large that despite our flaws, the church is the body of Christ at work today, a body that is meant to exude love and friendship beyond oneself, beyond those whom are easy to love. What was the point, Baldwin asked, the purpose of my salvation if it did not permit me to behave with love toward others no matter how they behaved toward me? Love, writes Baldwin, is a state of being, a state of grace. And this is how we are called to live in light of the resurrection of our Lord. Light and love and walking the walk. So let's go back to that question. What should we do with our lives? Or maybe a more poetic version from Mary Oliver from the Psalm 133 summer poem. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Our answer as people of faith may be a simple one to say, but a complex one to live out. 
Hence the repetitive nature of 1 John. We know it, we know it, we know it, but we need reminded of it again and again. We should spend our lives by being friends with Jesus, friends with one another. So we should follow the commandments to love God and love our neighbors so that we know true joy. There is a lot of superficial happiness that we are granted, quick dopamine fixes on our phone and in so many other places in our technological world. But to know true joy is to live the commandments of Christ. This is a joy that is so expansive that it moves us beyond our comfortable circles. It takes us to our neighbors. It moves us out of our echo chambers, beyond loneliness, beyond self-focused silos. I'll conclude with just one more example of how this friendship and love transforms our actions, develops a new state of being. Again, from this writer, James Baldwin, which paints this picture beautifully in my mind, a metaphor for how love can transform us. Baldwin wrote, Pretend, for example, that you were born in Chicago and you have never had the remotest desire to visit Hong Kong, which is only a name on a map for you. Pretend, though, that some convulsion, sometimes called accident, throws you into connection with someone who lives in Hong Kong and that you fall in love. Hong Kong will immediately cease to be a name and become the center of your life. And you may never know how many people live in Hong Kong, but you will know that one person lives there without whom you cannot live. And this is how our lives are changed. And this is how we are redeemed. What a journey this life is, dependent entirely on things unseen. If your love lives in Hong Kong and cannot get to Chicago, it will be necessary for you to go to Hong Kong. Perhaps you will spend your life there and never see Chicago again. And you will, I assure you, as long as space and time divide you from anyone you love, discover a great deal about shipping routes and airlines and earthquake, famine, disease, and war. And you will always know what time it is in Hong Kong, for you love someone who lives there. And love will simply have no choice but to go into battle with space and time and furthermore to win. If this kind of human love and connection can transform us, imagine how much can the love and friendship, the divine Christ, alter our very existence, change our plans, disrupt our schedules. God loves to interrupt us. For as we read this morning, Jesus experienced a life-giving birth, a death killing death, not only birth from the womb, but baptismal birth of his ministry and sacrificial death, teaching us of love and calling us friends, all the while the Spirit was confirming the truth, the reality of God's presence at Jesus' baptism and crucifixion, bringing those occasions alive for us. A triple testimony, the Spirit, the baptism, the crucifixion, all of which have forever changed our answer to that question, what should we do with our lives? Thanks be to God who calls us friend. Amen.